Welcome to Chuck's World of Infinite Mojo, brought to you by Holy Chuck Burgers. Our business is burgers. Good morning, Katerina Witt. There's no such thing as bad boys, only boys with bad hair. Sponsored by Maxwell's Clothiers, your bespoke tailor since 1961. And now, your host of Chuck's World of Infinite Mojo, Chuck Basti. All right, let's get this show on the road. I'm excited, Chuck. Uh, my name's Cam LaRock. I'm the producer of the show, and of course, I'm with the host, Chuck Basti. Chuck, what's new and exciting? So we finally landed Philadelphia Flyer Scott Lawton. And we got him. Today, we got him. Like, we got him. He's a, he's a, he's a former Oshawa general, so this is a really big deal. You know, obviously me being a huge Pete's fan, like that's my number one rival next to the New York Rangers. Um, but we're going to forgive that because that's part of his past. We're going to whitewash yep. that. We're going to give him a brand new start because he's been with the Flyers for like over a decade. Uh, but we're really excited to have Scott on the show. Yeah, Chuck. I mean, we all know how big of a Flyers fan you are. And even I got a couple of buddies who are big Flyers fans. I told him Scott was coming on and they're, oh, where can I watch it? Like, where is it going to be? I'm like, hold on. Like, let us get through the show and I'll let you know. But I mean, yeah, like just a great guy to have on the show. We'll learn more about him and everything. But uh, I'm excited, Chuck. And I know you are, too. Yeah. And the reason why I'm excited is because like Scott pretty much ex exemplifies everything that you are for icing and cake. You know, I love the fact that Scott, uh, he's been nominated for the King Clancy Award, uh, which is like one of the most philanthropic um, trophies that actually is the philanthropic trophy the NHL awards out. Um, and there's 31 nominees and there's, you know, one winner and 31 nominees never usually get acknowledged for that. So I thought it's really important because I had a, you know, a pro hockey player that told me once, Chris King, who's now with the NHL, you know, one tenth of one percent of what I do is a hockey player on the ice. Like who I am as a hockey player off the ice is my character, is my legacy and all that. And that's what I love about Scott is Scott, just one of those guys that gets it and does all that work off the ice as well. And he happens to also be a flyer and an alternate captain and my favorite team as well. So this is a this is kind of a big deal for me. Yeah. And I mean, not just his off ice work either. Like he puts in work on the ice. We talked about it a bit before. Like this guy can play any role, you know, yeah. go out there and hit, go out there and score a big goal. And uh, even me back in the day on NHL 20, I always had Scott Lawton on my team for that exact reason, <laughs> just because you could use him in any role. Uh, you just it. said kids, you know, you always have your, like your gamers come back afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> nice reference though. That was actually a nice plug. Yeah. I thought, I thought it had to be mentioned. Yeah. Without further ado, let's bring up the boy. Let's bring him up. Scott, how are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for being on the show, man. Like, uh, I know it's been a little bit, a little bit while in the in the making as well, but yes. good things happen to those who wait as well. But uh, I just want to welcome you to the show as well. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm a Flyers fan, so it's uh, it's a big deal for me to have you on the show. Uh, Riley Cote has been a big fan of your work as well, and uh, you know he he was I was actually lucky enough to have Riley set this up for us as well. So uh, again, thanks for the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited uh, to chat a little bit and, and uh, see where it goes. Yeah, so one of the things I want to bring up <clears throat> is the fact that you once were an Oshawa general and they just won last night uh, to go to the finals in the OHL uh, versus the London Knights. Should, should be a fantastic series. Uh, last year, it was my, oh my God, there you are. <laughs> right there. Yeah, there you are as a Jenny. So like walk us through this picture. Like you don't have that cheesy little mustache right there. What's going on? Yeah, uh, I think that's in Belleville, actually. But uh, one of my first couple years there, um, I was really fortunate. I think Osh was uh, such a great franchise and uh, the way they treat their players, everything like that. And I got to learn from um, some pretty great people. So uh, I was lucky enough to to find uh, my best man at my wedding there. And I was his best man, Boone Jenner, who's in uh, Columbus now. Um, we live together in Oshawa and um, we've been tight ever since. So a couple lifelong friends that I'll have forever and um, something that really helped my development, uh, not only as a player, but as a person. And, and my billets were great. Um, everyone was just great there to me. And, and uh, I absolutely love living there and, and being a part of it. You know, one thing I love, you mentioned billets as well. One thing I love about the junior experience is that 
whenever pro players come back to their old OHL or CHL franchise, they come back for, you know, whether it be a banner raising or a charity event or whatever like that. Like, I always love it when I hear them say, uh, I didn't stay in a hotel. I just called up my billet family and I just stayed with them because it just shows the Canadian, the Canadian hockey experience of what that does as a value added proposition to you know, the junior franchise with your billets as well. And how they treat you like a family, they take you in, you know, you go from like <clears throat> 17 to 20, you know, playing major junior hockey as well. And like, those are three huge development years for you guys on that there. So just speak a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, moving away from home at 16, um, pretty scary at first, I think, uh, especially being, um, so close to my family and, and my brother and everything like that. So that was, uh, a little bit of a culture shock, I would say to, to move to Oshawa right away. Um, moved in with billets and another young guy for half a year. And, uh, me and Booner just uh, couldn't stay away from each other. I couldn't drive uh, at the time. He was always picking me up. So I uh, decided to move in with him and, and uh, spent uh, three and a half years there with uh, Lisa and Rocky. So um, they were great to me. Lots of mini sticks, uh, mm. lots of different things. But uh, they always treated you well. It takes a special family, I think, to, to take in a couple of players and, and be a part of that. And um, they had two young boys that... Uh, that we always hung around and, and uh, went for nice dinners and, and things like that. So it was uh, it was a special experience and, and something that uh, really helped me, I think, uh, become a man, I guess, and, and uh, become part of it. Yeah, I'd be remiss if I didn't actually say, you know, you're transitioning from the generals over to Team Canada as well. <clears throat> we have a, a great shot. But you mentioned Boone Jenner as well, who obviously – world junior as well um you know long legacy now he's with columbus as well so just walk us through this picture here and like what you're feeling wearing the seat yeah um i think uh, you watch it as a kid uh growing up uh world juniors is um probably second to olympics in canada i would say uh we would always have a boxing day party at my house uh, watch the world juniors games um and, and you learned a lot but uh this was a special moment uh, for not only me but my family uh to be captain of canada i think uh it's special and and uh it's something that i uh, didn't take for granted um probably one of the more uh disappointing moments in my hockey career not being able to to get gold and, and even a medal at that tournament i think uh kind of built um some some mental toughness on that side of it and um going through that experience but uh it was a special experience anytime you get to to play for your country it's uh it's really special and uh it's something that uh i'll hold on to forever yeah you mentioned mental toughness as well because like i said there's so much pressure on you guys in world juniors and when they go there they're always expected to get gold you know i think canada could probably field two uh two teams you know like an a and b team as well, um, but again, there's adversity from the cross. He has never been on for the first time. Um, when they go to these tournaments as well, bigger ice in, in Europe as well. Um, but again, like probably the first time that you guys are on that stage as well, where you're developing that resiliency, that ability to pivot as well. So I thought I'd just talk, start off with, you know, the mental side of the game as well. Uh, and just kind of walk through, you know, your development, mindfulness, and just giving yourself the tools. Because I think nowadays, kids these days, they have all the knowledge in the world, they have all the resources. But when it comes down to actually implementing how to bring your state of anxiety down, how to elevate your state of awareness and consciousness up, uh, and I don't know that you and Riley have worked on that a lot, but just to ask you, like, what your practice is and how you are able to keep yourself in state. Yeah, yeah, I think. Uh early on in my career, kind of going up and down um, from the minors, getting called up for a couple games and going back down. I think uh, I probably didn't handle it uh, as well as I could have. Um, I, I think especially when I was uh, first coming up, being um, kind of the guy in junior, you always think uh, it's going to happen for you in pro. And it's a different game. It's uh, it's a lot harder. But uh I learned from that uh, that time on of of being a good teammate, being consistent every day, and being the same guy. And uh, I tried to bring that energy every day, um, especially after I played a year in the NHL, got sent back. Um, Riley was actually the assistant coach there, and and uh, we hung out a lot and and talked and and had a, a ton of good chats. But 
um, that year I just focused on, on myself, um, and that team down there and not worrying about getting called up or anything like that and, um, being consistent every day. So that's, uh, that's one thing that's really stuck with me. And then when you go through hard times during the year, I think, uh, especially this year, I went through a three, four month stretch of, of not playing very good hockey for, for our team. And, um, the mental side of it's, uh, bigger than the physical uh, of just overthinking things and, and coming home and, um, it was affecting me because you care. So I think uh, coming home and having it affect you, I think you go back to um, meditating and, and things like that and, and seeing the bigger picture of everything. And, and that's where um, it kind of takes over um, of not thinking so much. So um, I have a great support system too of, of family and things, but uh, I think that's huge of, of mental toughness and, and just kind of going through it and being that consistent person. Yeah. I think that the, uh, <clears throat> the root of all upset is an unmet expectation, you know, and then what happens when we have that un ex unmet expectation, because, you know, my head sees it going way differently than how reality goes. And that's just not the way life works. And then when life kind of pivots on you and you saw something that you saw going differently in your head to where you have to now pivot to, it's just like, <clears throat> I like to say, it's like a director. You know, if I was an actor in a movie, you know, I had memorized my lines and the director said, Hey, listen, guys, we were up all night last night. <clears throat> Didn't like this one scene. We've rewritten it. Here are your new lines. And then as an actor, I'm just like, well, I, I know my old lines. Yeah. The director says, yeah, well, there's a new scene now, like learn your lines. And as an actor, you now have to pivot. You have to like learn these new lines right away fast as you possibly can and be able to get into that character and, and just being in hockey or in life, like it's the exact same way. How fast can you pivot is going to be like the indicative, you know, of the leadership of what that brings to the table of your value as a human being or a teammate uh, and how you pivot as well. And you guys went through a ton of that during COVID. <clears throat> you know, you guys were in Toronto, we were in the bubble as well. How did you handle the, the pivoting? Because the anxiety was through the roof then. Um, all this pressure on you. You guys had a really great run here in Toronto uh, during the COVID lockout. Uh, but I thought we'd just talk a little bit about like what you did to pivot, how you use your, your support system to help manage your state and be able to move forward. Yeah, sorry, my cats. Uh, can you hear my cat right now? <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, yeah, COVID, uh, COVID was pretty hard. I think uh, I was living in a condo uh, at the time in, in Philadelphia. Um, not much to do. Um, a lot of sitting around uh, waiting to, to see what would happen. But uh, yeah, it was it was hard. It was hard being in the bubble, I think, uh, being so close to home, living 10 minutes down yeah. the street and, and all my family's at home and everyone's there. So that was uh, pretty tough for me. But uh, probably um, one of the the best hockey moments I've had was was scoring an overtime winner in the bubble and, and crushing being, goal too by the way like top cheese that was a sick goal <laughs> but uh no it was uh it was hard it was it was definitely hard for guys and their families too I um Couturier had a had a kid three days before and had to leave for the bubble things like that that uh, people really don't realize so um it was hard but uh you're playing hockey at the same time and and uh and it was pretty special, but uh, definitely was weird living in a condo in Philly and, and uh, not knowing what to do with yourself for, for a couple months. I swear I'd always ask you this question if I got to talk to you about this, but like when you score that goal, I'm jumping up in my, in my, my living room, like, you know, throwing shit. And like, you didn't even celebrate, like your face was like this. And I'm just like, what a dude! Like that should be like where you're dancing, like Mike. No, no, I was, I was, I was fired up. I, I you were fired uh, up. I was, like you're a two out of my fired up community. Yeah. I, I idle at an eight. You know, yeah, it takes me yeah. two steps to get to a ten. But I was like, how is this guy this calm, man? I'd be like smashing my stick against the glass. Yeah. Like, and you were just so calm. How were you so calm? I don't know. I was, I was pretty fired up. I, Jakey, uh, Jakey jumped on me there, and and a couple of the guys did, but. Uh, yeah, that was a, a really weird time. You got the fake crowd noise in the building. Yeah. Um, I remember getting, I got scratched uh, two or three games before it um, coming in. And then I, I kind of said, uh, I got to do something here and make an impact and, and uh, be a part of this. So it was a good run for us. Obviously, it didn't happen in game seven against the Islanders, but uh, uh, probably, uh, the, well, it was the longest run that uh, I've been on in Philly. And, and uh, we were playing some good hockey before uh, 
before COVID kind of took us down. We were in Tampa Bay. I remember that day. Uh, I won't forget that day, but uh, we thought it was going to be two weeks. And then uh, it's about six months later. Life happens. Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's yeah. so crazy. Like when that went down, I was just like, my, my, my buddy said, ah, I think this will be like three months. I'm like three months. Come on, man. There's no way they're going to like, there's trillions of dollars on, 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 on hand, you know, in the economy or NBA closes their season, major league baseball, put their season on pause. Then NHL comes out and it's like, this is not going to happen. Now I did get, you know, NHL playoff hockey in August, which didn't suck, you know, for yep. you know, nothing else happening and you, you get weaned off it as well. But um, yeah, pivoting on that side there, like, I think that's, you know, the one time in life that we'll have in our generation where you were finally given the time that you always complain that you don't have. And it was really interesting to see what people did with that time. You know, I use that time to do a lot of therapy and do a lot of reading and just sit back and, you know, do a lot of healing in my life as well. Um, you know, developed great relationships during that time. So the anxiety for me wasn't as bad, but you know, um, it was, it was definitely a different time as well. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to pivot to, um, to the Flyers organization as well, because obviously I'm a bit of a homer this way. Uh, I've always been a Flyers fan since I've been, you know, seven years old. I grew up, my dad's in the armed forces. So we did a stint at the embassy in, in DC. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in Virginia, you know, watching the, the broad street bullies go out. My dad used to get some tickets as well. And he used to go down to the old spectrum and watch the games. Uh, but the culture for the Flyers to me has just always been etched in Mr. Snyder's legacy. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to, to meet Mr. Snyder about six months before he passed away at his gala. Uh, but I thought we'd just start right away with like bring up the slides for uh, the Flyers uh, culture as well. And just have you talked to right now, like obviously Jonesy is now back in the in the president's role. Uh, Breer is obviously now in the GM role as well. Uh, and just bringing that into the culture as well, where, you know, like things are starting to get back to where Mr. Snyder is. Yeah, it's... Uh... It was pretty special for us uh, this year, um, kind of having that family feel of um, of all the old alumni coming back uh, kind of in the fold. And um, Danny B as the GM, I was uh, actually lucky enough uh, the lockout year I played five games. Uh, he had a, I think he had a broken hand, um, kind of made the team that way uh, when, when he was out. So played with him for a little bit, uh, Jonesy. We had a great relationship of, of when he was in the media and then uh, yeah. having Dan Hilferty, I think, uh, kind of take over. And, and uh, it's been really special the way they've treated us, um, really focused on our families and, and uh, taking care of them and um, everything on the ice, but uh, everything off the ice that makes a difference. And um, that's why the Flyers are so special uh, to me, especially, I think, uh, having all the alumni come around and, and you see all these guys that are um, still legends in the community and, and uh, they care. And, and that's the biggest thing is, is they care about the flyer success. Um, they care about uh, what you're doing on the ice and everything like that. And um, it's special. So it's, it's, uh, it's awesome to be a part of this organization, I think, and, and to be there for that long. Um, I feel very blessed and grateful, and and uh, yeah, there's Hartsey. Played with him. <laughs> I actually lived with him. Uh, I lived with him in uh, Haddonfield. Uh, He's a beauty. Oh, uh, he invited me. I was 18 years old. Flew in. Uh, had no idea what was going on. It was a lockout year, and uh, he invited me to live with him and showed me around and showed me the ropes. So that uh, I'll never forget that from from him. That. Uh, that still goes a long way with uh, some of our guys that uh, take in some of the young guys, but uh, that was special to me. So I'm still a little disappointed that he cut off all of his hair as well, because like, I think he was just afraid of getting called Chuck Basti when he went down the road and his wife just said, Hey, we're not having this anymore. Yeah. And just cut all of his hair off as well. Cause there's no good explanation why you get rid of good flow like that. There's just, yeah, no. I know I'm going to kick his ass on the course here in two days. So I'll let him know. You tell him I said that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> there's a, <clears throat> a picture of Bernie as well that we had uh, with, uh, with Eric and Eric's, you know, been great as well coming back. I, I love the fact that they bring Eric back now and he's a welcome crew of the alumni. I was just at the alumni event in January as well. So we got to go to the dressing room with these guys and, you know, watch them skate and, and only Philadelphia puts in 18,000 people for an alumni game, you know, on an off night. It's amazing. Um, you know, there's Bernie getting kissed by Eric as well, which just, you know, like makes my heart grow three sizes bigger, like the Grinch, you know what I mean? 
Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been, it, and Bernie's awesome. He always comes around and, um, Biggie, actually, I, uh, golf with him five, probably five years ago, uh, down in Toronto. And I was so nervous on the first tee. Didn't, that was kind of the first time, uh, talking to him. I think I made an eight on the first hole. Couldn't get out of the right rough. I was so nervous and then kind of settled down, but, uh, that is a that's a big man. His forearms and his hands and everything that engulfs you. So he's uh, obviously a legend of the game, and and uh, it's nice seeing these guys because, uh, like I said, that's what uh, makes it so special is the alumni and the people that have been around. Yeah, and you know one thing I just love about the alumni as well is like I was always just a really big fan of Zach Hill because Zach was the uh, the PR director for the Flyers for, I don't know, three decades, you know, there, there he is there, just a legend of a human being. Like I've done nothing good in my life to deserve the kindnesses that Zach Hill bestowed upon me. You know, I've had countless friends and family wherever they were across the country and just say, Hey, listen, Zach. And I have my friends come down for morning skate and just, you know, they're Flyers fans and never a hesitation from Zach. I mean, he's just always been a champ of a human being, always have a smile on his face. Uh, I was really happy when I went back to Philly for the alumni game to see that they created the, the media center right now in his name as well. So I thought maybe we'd just talk a little bit about Zach. Yeah. Um, one of the nicest people you'll, uh, you'll ever come around in the game. I think he is, uh, he's a special human being and uh, treats everyone the same. I think uh, just the way he went ar- uh, about it and, and everyone said the same thing about him, about uh, how special he is and, um you never really saw him as a as a media guy for us and and that's a good thing uh you never really saw him he was always behind the scenes making sure everything was good and uh he i I still keep in touch with him um saw him this year went and had a beer with him uh, after when they announced uh his press room and everything like that and um someone that uh that just made you feel welcome right from the get-go i remember meeting him my first time and um he, a lot of the guys will say the same thing, but, uh, every day, um, always had a smile on his face and, and, uh, yeah, made you feel welcome and, and was really good at his job too. And, uh, just a good human being that's now, uh, enjoying retirement. Uh, we miss him around here though. I I'll tell you that. Yeah. I saw him last year at the flyer skates and there he is in the right hand side there like, uh, doing uh, his best uh, job uh, Denver impersonation. <laughs> yeah. What a cut from him. It's amazing. Uh, that's like, obviously before he started with the Flyers that he might've been like 26 years old there, you know, rocking his John Denver haircut without the glasses as well. But, um, like just talk a little bit about what it means for you as a professional to have someone like Zach Hill in your back pocket, that he's just doing all the stuff to take the anxiety off you guys, uh, conducting your interviews and what a professional he was as well, just in how he did his work. Yeah. And, and he was, um, He's, he's been around forever. I think he was with the 76ers before. That's the picture from it. And um, kind of like what I touched on, he just treated everyone the same. And then everyone had um, the same feeling about him. Um, but yeah, he did everything for you. And um, he would say no, no for, sometimes for you and, and everything like that, which uh, sometimes you appreciated. But uh he was always in your corner, like you said, and, and always wanted the best for you. And it was always fair to the media, too. But uh, he was fair to fair to the guys and, and uh, really let us have our space, too. So um, that's why they they win that uh, that award pretty much every year. The, the media award, Zach won it uh, a couple times when I was there. So, um, yeah, he and, and every media member says the same thing, too. So um, I hope he's enjoying his uh, his land out in uh, Ohio, out in, out in Ohio. He's got the little pond stocked uh, back there. So uh, he was so proud of that, too. I, I saw him at the Flyer Skate Center last year. He came back to, to take some pictures and whatnot. And I was talking to him for about a half an hour and just how much he's enjoying retirement as well. <clears throat> One of the things I always loved about Zach. Uh, is when I always asked him, like, why are you so kind? Why do you do this? Like, how do you keep doing this? He's just like, because it came from the top. And Mr. Schneider, you know, had this legacy where he was like, everybody gets treated with respect here. Uh, With the players, yes, like there are some, you know, hard parts of the job as well. But, uh, you know, he used to say the culture always started from the top with Mr. Schneider and always came down and filtered out. Uh, And people like Bob Kelly, um, you know, with the Flyers as well, as, as well as the alumni. 
you know, you really get that energy when you come back. When I first came back the first time, you know, like 15 years ago, I thought that this was just fake. Like there's no way somebody can, you know, create this amount of energy of positivity and whatnot. And then just trip after trip, the flyers have always just proven to me, like <clears throat> they always had this culture that Mr. Snyder had created as well about their players, the community, the family, you know, the charities that they support as well. Um, and one of the things that uh, I love about you is that you were nominated for the King Clancy uh, award as well. And uh, I said this off camera, but there's 32 teams. There's one winner of that award. Every team um, submits a, a nominee as well. So you were a Flyers nominee last year as well. Um, but this to me is my most favorite trophy because <clears throat> this shows character of leadership and what you do off the ice. <clears throat> because like I said, one tenth of 1% of what we do is as a hockey player, <clears throat> you know, and who you are off the ice, you know, really manifest to how you can play on the ice, what your support system's like, what kind of teammate you're going to be. But I thought we'd just talk a little bit about what you've done off the ice, you know, and why you've chosen to do this, Scott, because this is a clear choice. This isn't something that's easy to do. It's hard to be a professional. It's hard to be, you know, uh, on a team for 10 years. Um, and everyone tries to keep that focus on being a professional and staying up. So like this takes energy. Why have you chosen to do this? Yeah, I think uh, especially early on, I think I learned from from some of the best and and uh, right away was was uh, always invited to go to the toy drives, things like that at Christmas and, and being part of it. So um, I think uh, when you're when you're in a community for this long, you want to be a part of it. And, and it's uh, yeah, it's definitely somewhere uh where I, I see myself uh, being um, after I'm done playing and, and being part of this community because uh, I've loved it so much and, and my wife has too. So um, it's been really special to be a part of it. And um, yeah, I learned from guys like Drew and Simmons and Voracek and uh, Brandon Manning, who I played with in the minors in the NHL. All these guys were always out in the community, um, especially when I, early on in my career, um, all had foundations, people after games, and and uh, just learned from them, and uh, kind of took its, uh, I guess its own course over the last couple of years uh, with uh, the LGBTQ guests that I, I uh, host after games, and then um, through the Ronald McDonald House and and uh, PSPCA and and everything like that that. Uh, that I've kind of um, built relationships and, and my wife has too. And, and we just uh, kind of took off with it. And, and uh, it, it's a pretty fulfilling feeling to get out in the community. Um, you don't have this platform forever. And uh, it's a pretty short, uh, pretty short, um, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's a short window to, to have this platform. And I feel very grateful for it. So I want to use it the best I can and, and uh, be a part of it. Yeah, and there's a picture here. I was at the Flyers uh, home opener in uh, October. Uh, you guys were playing the Canucks and uh, Coots scored a greasy, greasy uh, penalty shot goal that just threw the place crazy. But you know, after that was going on, they put this picture up on the on the Jumbotron, which is, you know, amazing this this new jumbotron uh but these are like you know welcome friends of scott lawton here as well so you've got four seats there with four um of, of, of your chosen community so just talk a little bit about what you've done with this yeah so at uh jvr and i uh three years ago um kind of came up with the idea of of uh hosting um guests at the game and, and our community team does uh such a good job uh, helping us out and, and uh, going to different uh, people and, and finding people for the games and everything like that. But uh, would always host uh, four guests, uh, see them after, take pictures and, and kind of just hear their story of, of uh, what they've been through. And, and uh, a lot of it was their first hockey game and said they were going to come back and they couldn't believe how fast it was and physical. So I think that's uh, probably my favorite part is is building um, fans that way and, and growing the game. I think that's uh, what we're trying to do here is is grow the game um, uh, to to have it uh, where it needs to be. But uh, yeah, it's been special. Me and J JVR uh, was huge uh, in it and. Um, Pride night, we had uh, 50 officers and uh, firefighters and everything like that, a, a part of the LGBTQ uh, community, um, kind of just uh, mingling and, and doing all that. So 
uh, this year, um, I think it was 20, 25 home games where uh, you go to to see these people and and you get to hear about it and and that's uh, that's pretty fulfilling for me to to hear them say they're going to come back to another game because um, you're building new fans and and a new uh, a new generation of fans too. Yeah, you also mentioned uh, like the LGBTQ community. Uh, we had Brian Kitts on the podcast a couple of times from the You Can Play project as well. Uh, and there was a big, big blow up last year as well with uh, the Pride Nights and Pride Tape and everything like that as well. Um, <clears throat> but you got caught up in that as well. Uh, one of the things where, like immediately came to mind. Yeah, there you go. So like <laughs> <laughs> Scott Lawton will use Pride Tape despite NHL ban. If they want to say something, they can. Ooh, <laughs> saucy. Um, talk a little bit about what was going on. You, you look like you're in mode right there. What a great picture they picked for that one. Um, but you know, the NHL is a big, big conglomerate and they've got a lot of power with that big swing and stick of theirs. Um, how do you go up against the NHL and, and why? Yeah, I think, uh, I was asked about it. I think it was really on in the year when they, uh, came out with all the, the stuff about the jerseys and, and everything like that and the tape, um, I was asked about it uh, early on and, and that was kind of my answer and it was truthful and um, it's just how I felt. So uh, we have the tape. Um, I'm going to, on our pride night, I'm, I'm going to use it and, and let, uh, let it be visible and, and just let people know that uh, they're welcome at the game. And, and, uh, and, and I don't know, I'm sticking up for it. And, and that's how I felt about it at the time. And then I still do. I still, would have put the tape on um, for that night and and uh, had it on my stick. I think it's uh, something that's been close to me for a while and and something that uh, means something to me. So um, yeah, if I got fined or whatever, you pay the fine and and you keep moving forward. But uh, it it really didn't affect me. Yeah, I, I love the fact that it didn't affect you. But more importantly, like how you became an ally. You know, I, and I said this to you, you know, uh, on the phone. Uh, before we started taping this as well, but it takes a special kind of person to not be part of a community to have a voice for that community. So for example, you know, if you're a straight person and you're an ally for LGBTQ communities, you know, that holds a lot of water because you're able to create that. I don't have a skin in the game. I'm not gay. Uh, but I believe that all gay people deserve to be treated with respect and understood and heard and accepted and for who they are, because I want to be accepted for who I am. And we're always going to agree to disagree on, many different things, you know, but if we can't just give people the basic human dignity uh, of who they love or how they love them, you know, that makes no sense to me as well. So I love the fact that you just become an ally and a staunch supporter uh, of the LGBT community. Uh, we had Brian Burke on the podcast and obviously, you know, his son, Patrick uh, and Brian Kitts created You Can Play. And uh, he had a great response to that to the NHL world. He was just like, hey, listen, we're not saying that you have to agree with, you know, you know, the gay lifestyle or the LGBT community. What we're saying here is that you're welcome at our games, that this is a safe place and you can still show up and we will still support who you are as people, you know, as fans, as human beings, and you don't have to agree with it. You know, like that's just not the point of the entire Pride Night. It's, it's about showing solidarity and showing, you know, welcomeness to the event. Thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And I think our, I think our games, um, come a long way from from when I entered the league yeah um I, I think our room has for sure um in Philly because uh just about the conversations we've had um as a group uh not only with with this but uh with other um other things that go on throughout the year so um I, I think a big one is is um the hockey culture um, kind of the language you use and everything like that. And, and I think our room has, has come a, uh, a long way from, from when I was first in and, and just the education of it, of, of, uh, if people understand it and, and, uh, and see it, um, they, they get a better sense for it and, and they understand that language affects people. Um, the way you speak, uh, the way you act, uh, and, and it goes a, a long way to, to stand up for, for something that uh, is close to you and, and you believe in and, and something that uh, can go a long way uh, in the game of hockey and, and grow new fans. And um, if you have a, 
a closeted uh, player that uh, is around, they, they feel comfortable. And, and uh, that's something that, uh, that uh, will continue in Philly. And, and uh, I know guys uh, really appreciate it and, and are a part of it. Uh, and especially with, uh, with pride. Yeah. And I think it's important just to say that this isn't just uh, exclusive with LGBTQ. This is <clears throat> racism, yeah. this is bigotry. This is any kind of ism you know, that takes away power or tries to suppress another human being, you know, for how they look, for what they do, for who they worship, for how they love. You know, I think, you know, I got a, a great friend of mine, his name is James McNeil. He came up with a great acronym for this. It, 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 it's called Hurrah. And it stands for heard, understood, respected, and accepted. And if one of those is missing, it's the same four. They're all disconnects as a human being. If I hear what you're saying, I understand that's your point of view. I respect your ability to have that point of view and they accept that's your point of view. You know, I'm not trying to change you. I'm not trying to fix you. I'm not trying to like manipulate you. And the person is just left on the other side with feeling heard, understood, respected and accepted. And there's no really ammunition on the other end. You know, it's, it's hard and they say sticks. In, and I love what you said about language because, you know, language means, you know, it, it's created with the word. Um, when you create that, you put a, a declaration out into, um, the universe of, of what your intention is. Uh, they say sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, that's so tr untrue. <laughs> like mm -hmm. names hurt you, you know, and young kids these days, like, you know, they don't have the tools to deal with like names hurt me. You know, you know, when you sling, you know, racist tropes or, or, or gender, um, you know, suppressing language to people, you know, that hurts until they actually learn what that means and they can go with that as well. So Absolutely. I'm really glad that you're just being an ally for people as well and in the community as well, having no skin in the game that way, but just doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, and that's the thing is, is, uh, doing the right thing and, and just being welcoming. I think, uh, you're a human being. And uh, that's the thing is, is uh, it doesn't matter your skin color, um, exactly like you said, who you love, um, it doesn't affect you and, and it shouldn't. So, um, yeah, that's the biggest thing and, and uh, kind of what I touched on before, but uh, to grow the game and, and to have those new fans, um, I think it, uh, it goes such a long way and it's, it's special to me and um, something I'll do for, for my whole career for sure. And, and uh because the stories you hear and, and uh, learning about different people um, throughout, it's uh, it's awesome. It's special. And um, a kid, a kid we met, uh, me and Reamer, um, two years ago. Um, she started playing hockey right after she came to the game. Uh, we saw a couple videos of her uh, on the ice and everything like that. So, if you can do that, uh, uh, that's uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to get out of this. And and uh, just to see new people's faces and, and uh, grow the game and, and feel welcome. I think it's actually uh, probably the coolest thing of what I do is like when you can get into the OHL or minor hockey or pro hockey games and you're able to make the bridge between, you know, meeting their, their, their heroes off the ice after the game. And even as me as a neutral third party person, just, you know, while I'm waiting for my interview or my guy and I'm just looking around the room and seeing young kids come in there and their eyes just lit up like saucers of who they get to meet their goal. And I remember my, my very first guy that I got to meet was Mike Gartner and Mike Gartner uh, was a, was a rookie with the Capitals. And uh, you know, I, I played hockey with Mike for about 10 years and, you know, after he retired, obviously, uh, but just a class act of a human being in, in, Every single person that comes up to him, autograph, picture, whatever like that, uh, the, the, the joy these people get to see that you guys get to create, you know, in this last literally for lifetimes. Like it's a memory that just stays with inside them. And it's just such a gift that you guys have to do. So I'm just really glad to see that you actually exercise that. Um, not a lot of guys do that. And, you know, like I said, I understand there's a whole different level of professionalism. So when I meet someone like yourself, that, that makes that ripple effect in people's lives as well. Um, I'm overjoyed as well. And I know that it came from the top with Mr. Snyder. Uh, when you were first coming up with the Flyers and you obviously uh, with you know the fandoms uh, coming up as well, uh, you mentioned Riley uh, Cote was your assistant coach as well, but that culture kind of get bred as well. And I wanted to kind of segue this into talking about Mr. Snyder and his legacy with the Flyers as well, because I really believe it all started from that there. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. Schneider at, at the gala uh, just six months before he passed away. I took that on a BlackBerry, believe it or not. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to go through some slides here, and I just thought I'd just you know leave it to you to talk about Mr. Schneider and his culture and his, his, his legacy. Yeah. Um, he, he was uh, he was a really special person, I think. Um, just uh, what he did for the city of Philadelphia um, early on and, and uh, how much passion he had for the Flyers. And I think that's where um, that family feel comes from is, is Mr. Snyder. Um, I remember uh, I was getting called up and, and uh, didn't know much about the Flyers, to be honest. And, and that was one thing that uh, everyone always said to me was Mr. Snyder. Um, always would come in, shake your hand after a game, win or loss, look you in the eyes, shake your hand. Um, and he would always say he was proud of you or, or whatever he said, but uh that meant a ton to us. And I know it meant a ton to the older guys. I was pretty um, new to it and, and young and coming up, but uh, yeah, he, we, we were able to go to his house um, when he was a little sick there at the end. Um, he had a, a big lunch for all of us and, and he cared about us as people always shook your hand, uh, looked you in your eye and, and called you by name and, and he knew everyone. Um, it didn't matter if you were staff player, um, and, and that's just the way, um, he was and, and everything that he's done, um, his legacy continues to live on, not only through the flyers, but Snyder hockey and, and everything that he's done for, um, people around the, the communities of Philadelphia. Um, it goes, a, a lot, it's a lot bigger than hockey and, um, it's someone that, uh, ha has made the flyers what they are. And, and, uh, that's why you want to be a flyer is, is that family feel and, and to have that. And, and he played a massive part and he, he was the biggest part in that. So, um, he's missed Mr. Snyder's missed and, um, just a great human being and, and someone that, uh, that was really special for all of us. Yeah. There's a picture of me in front of Mr. Snyder's statue when it first got unveiled as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to roll a couple of pictures here as we go through talking about Mr. Snyder and we'll, I'll just kind of like tap on each one of them as well. Um, one of the things I love about Mr. Snyder, there's a picture of Bernie giving him the thumbs up, uh, scoop Cooper, uh, the reporter for the flyers for like 50 years, took that picture. I thought it was just fantastic. Uh, but just, you know, you know, have that being outside the Comcast, you know, um, you know, the, sorry, the Wells Fargo center as well. Mm -hmm. It's just every time I go by, I always take a picture of it as well, because like, he's the man who created all this. Uh, Gary Bettman once told me that if we had one franchise that we could template in the NHL, it would be Mr. Snyder's model because it just works. Uh, and he didn't ask anyone to buy season tickets. He just went into the community and just uh, created the initiatives as well that were important to the community. And then the community came back and supported them in a very Eagles like loyal uh, town. Uh, Eagles are number one, obviously, in Philly. Uh, but for decades, the Flyers were sold out 18,000 um, for for years. So, um, you know, there's part of the cabinet that they just created this year. I was so happy when I came back to Philadelphia this year as well after COVID. had been away for a few years and see that they had, you know, put this outside your locker room as well, this, uh, you know, this tribute to Mr. Snyder as well. Uh, and now with Jonesy and, and Briere coming back as well, that culture, how that shifted. So I thought we'd just speak a little bit about how that culture has kind of like affected you now and Jonesy and Briere coming back and how that Mr. Snyder legacy has kind of like come back full full circle. Yeah, that's that's uh, awesome. That's right before we walk out on the ice. So that's uh, that's kind of the last thing you see. And, and um, it, it's special. I'm, I'm really happy they did that, too, and, and had all that. And, and you see the history of the names above your stall. Um, you see all that. Uh, you see the pictures around the room. Um, they got every team picture there from I don't know how long, but uh, so you see all these guys. But uh, yeah, that's that's the biggest thing about Philly is is like you said, is the culture and and the people that are in it. And um, I think I think for us uh, having Danny B and Jonesy, guys who have played uh, and played for the Flyers, but they're around a lot, and uh, you don't really see that with general manager and president. Um, but they're around a lot. They're in the room. Um, they're talking to you, seeing how you're doing. And, uh, I think it goes a long way for the young guys, but, uh, the old guys too, you see it, you appreciate it. And, uh, you really see how much they care. Um, and, and that's what, uh, uh, Dan Helferty has done, um, coming in here the, la the last year has, has really, um, made us feel like a family. 
um, and, and taking care of our families. So um, it's it's been special uh, this year, especially uh, getting back to kind of, uh, I don't know if we lost it there for a little bit, but uh, getting back to that family feel and, and uh, you don't have that on many teams of, of uh, your GM coming down, um, eating breakfast and, and talking to you and, and seeing what's going on. And, and um, it, it just adds to it. And it's really special and, and good human beings, too. You bring, you bring in these guys that, uh, that really want you to do well. It's, uh, they're not blowing smoke and, and uh, it's special to be a part of them. And, um, yeah, don't take it for granted. And I know a lot of these guys don't. Yeah, there's a picture. These are the last pictures we have of um, <clears throat> the Snyder event as well. They always have a skate at the start of the year for the Snyder Foundation as well. For the and, and we have the banner as well for the the Snyder uh, Hockey Organization as well. And there's Riley on the on the <laughs> on the on the jumbotron, you know, for him to to come down and. You heard about his injury. His uh, his yeah, last. Yeah. Injury. <laughs> 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 he to, to heal it. <laughs> like, I was dying. I was dying. He goes, "Yeah, last shift, I did it. I couldn't believe it." Uh, <laughs> in <laughs> overtime as well. <laughs> and there's there's Riley there as well. Like uh, we were down for the Snyder skate. That's uh, the guy on the left hand side. A, a friend of mine, Reggie. He was actually speaking at the gala um, as an 18 year old, uh, graduating from the program for Mr. Snyder. He was the last guy to speak before Mr. Snyder passed away, um, at his gala in 2015. Uh, and there's Riley on the right. I mean, I just got so much respect for Riley because, you know, as being an enforcer in the game in just coming through a ton of trauma as well and concussions, uh, the healing that man has done has yeah. been remarkable. So I thought we'd just talk a little bit about Riley and there's Derek in the middle as well. I mean, I love Derek Sennemeyer. Uh, nasty they have the uh, the nasty knuckles podcast if you actually want to laugh this is a great show you were just on it recently as well uh, yeah. I, I mean i've never seen riley laugh as hard as he did uh, you know like, like <laughs> he had tears going down his eyes uh and derek just really giving it to him about his mcl as well so yeah no they're uh i can't i can't keep it together when riles starts laughing it's it's <laughs> nuts it's a 30 <laughs> second laughing fit but uh yeah it's nasty i was with for uh I want to say seven years um, up and down. And, and uh, we went for a ton of dinners on the road, um, hung out all the time. Um, so he was, uh, he, he's one of the best. He's, he's got such great energy. Um, every day he brings it. And, and uh, yeah, he's a, he's a flyer. He's a, he's a guy that uh, cares about the, the guys and, and uh, what him and Riles are doing right now is awesome, I think. And, um, yeah, Riles has, uh, I've been with him for a while too. Um, got called up to Adirondack in 2012. He was coaching there. So that was kind of the first, uh, moment I had with him, but, uh, Riles is helping so many people in this world. I think, uh, what he's doing away from, from hockey and, and, uh, what he's done for his, uh, his own, um, concussions and everything like that. And, and what he went through. Um, it's not an easy job to do that and, and uh, to be, um, I don't know, on all the time, I guess, and, and fighting all those big, big guys. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're two guys that, uh, that mean a lot to me. And, and uh, Riles, uh, yeah, Riles, I can't say good, uh, enough good things about him. He's, uh, he's a guy that uh, I'll keep in touch with for, for a long, long time. Uh, there's a there's a funny story I, I thought I'd tell as well. Like, so I'm a huge Pelly Lindbergh fan. Obviously, he passed away tragically in the Porsche mm -hmm. accident in '85. Uh, but when I was down in Philly this time, I actually, you know, like Riley said, "Hey, why don't you ask Derek about his Flyers uh, story about Pelly?" I'm like, "Oh, he has one." Because I mean, like, Derek's younger than I am, so he would only have been like seven years old or so when when Pelly passed away. Um, so I asked her, like, what happened? He's like, oh, yeah, Pelly took me for a drive in his Porsche. And this is a 930 slant nose that he sent back to the factory to have it, like, thrown on a, another 100 horsepower on this as well. Uh, and Derek's father, Sudzy, like, the, the mm -hmm. previous trainer for at the Flyer for 25 years, went over and he grabbed Pelly by the neck. And he said, you ever take my kid on a, a joy run like that in that Porsche because Derek had come back and say, Hey dad, guess what? I was just on this amusement park ride of this Porsche, you know, driving on the road at 160 miles an hour. And, you know, I thought that was absolutely hysterically funny. It's ironic, but um, you know, the fact that they have this 
long standing relationship with the Flyers and he knows everybody that he coaches off the ice. And this kid's name is Elvis, for God's sake. You know, mm-hmm. like, yep. Yep. Kid, Elvis, like, you want to talk about an unmet expectation of what that kid has to live up to with a name like Elvis, right? Good, uh, good goalie, good goalie. Yeah, yeah. And, he went, and so I hear it, and, and you know, like watching him kind of move up and just having Derek talk about Elvis, you know, I almost feel like I've, I've never met him, but I almost feel like I know him just by yeah. like, how everyone talks about him as well. So, yeah. No, it's uh, they're they're two great guys, and and took care of me when I was young. Yeah. Uh, so moving forward, right now you got the you know a season that obviously didn't go the way we wanted to do. Hey, I'm just gonna be the first person to say overachieved on what I expected you guys were gonna do, but just like they said in the, the Nasty Knuckles podcast, you know, the last ten games, you know, like tailwinded down as well. But uh, really happy with the direction of the team is going, and like more importantly. Uh, the Capitals get swept by the the rags, and uh, I was happy to see that as well. But at the same time, playoff hockey is playoff hockey. It's it's nice to get there. But the most important part is that you guys are there directionally wise now moving forward, right pieces of the puzzle in place as well. So thoughts are ahead for your off season right now and moving forward to start of the season uh, in twenty in twenty four. Yeah, I think guys are hungry. Um, that's probably the toughest. Uh... The toughest I've taken a year, um, just the way it went. Uh, you're in a playoff spot since January, um, playing really good hockey. Um, and, and then you have those Metro games that are so important, not even the eight-game stretch where you kind of uh, – we lost ourselves a little bit, yeah. but uh, you have big Metro games. Um, we probably could have uh, taken Pittsburgh out of it. We could have taken Washington out of it uh, early on, um, and we didn't win those games. And the Islanders, uh, we lost the game. And those are games that uh, really count. And um, it, it's definitely a, a learning experience, but uh, I know I'm not getting any younger, and, and uh, guys aren't getting any younger. I know I know we're a young team, but uh, – I think uh, we have to take a next step next year. I know people probably have their expectations about us again of, of what we're going to be, but I know guys in there believe in each other, and, and that's the biggest thing. You believe as a group uh, it can take you a far, uh, a really far distance, and, and that's, uh, I guess, the message uh, uh, that everyone has is is uh, we can take a next step and, and be a better team and um, – kind of take that underdog mentality again of everyone was expecting us to finish last with San Jose and Chicago. And yeah. um, if you look at our roster, um, we have pretty good team um, uh, through our forward depth and, and yeah. our defensemen coming up, uh, picking up Drysdale, young, young defensemen that uh, have taken steps. So um, I, I think we can take a, a, a next step uh, next year and, and, um, be part of the solution. I think uh, guys are, like I said, hungry to to get back at it. It's uh, it's an empty feeling at the end of the year when when you're thrown on the TV to to watch playoff hockey and you're not involved. And and there's nothing like playoff hockey in Philly. I really don't. Uh, I've experienced it twice, and um, one time I got stretched off, but the other time was. Pretty- <laughs> The other time was so there's that. Yes. Yeah, that. yeah. So I don't really remember that one, but uh, the other one uh, was was really special, and um, I want these guys to experience it and, and be a part of this because I know guys care in that room, and um, it's exciting. It's exciting to to have our young guys take a, a huge step and get that opportunity last year. Yeah, and again, it's like going through adversity. You guys went through a ton of adversity this year as well. Uh, I think Taurus has really got the guys. You know, whether it be you know, you like him or you don't like him. It's kind of irrelevant in the point. But, you know, the fact is he can take a team. He did this with Boone Jenner's team in Columbus as well, where, you know, glass ceiling and the upset Tampa Bay as well. And, you know, he just has a superpower of getting that that level of, of, of expectation out on the ice as well. And, I, again, I think the culture, you know, after AV had left, uh, really kind of dipped down a little bit. Um, so I'm really, really, as a Flyers fan, I'm really, really happy right now with – Jonesy being there and and you can see it in the small things that they do, you know, on game day or, you know, during the rest of the year, the fans are now starting to come back in the seats. I don't see as many angry feeds on my Facebook page anymore, uh, you know, from disgruntled flyer fans who've kind of felt they've been, you know, taken away from Mr. Snyder's model as well. Um, But I thought we'd just end uh, the segment talking about perseverance, because I think this is a superpower that I think most kids miss 
these days is, you know, when I'm interviewing guys, young kids, like you say, coming up in uh, junior hockey, they've always been the best at what they've had on every single team. Even in world juniors, you know, they might have to go to the bottom six versus the top six, but they go back to their junior team. They're still on top of the world. I love what you said on Nasty Knuckles podcast. You thought that it, it's it's a gift to get down to the minors um, because who you get to develop and be and depending on what you want to bring that energy down of what you're there to learn. Uh, but I thought we'd talk a little bit about what your advice is to kids about how to use perseverance, uh, be able to go through that wall, not take things personally and be able to go through that wall with confidence and with mastery. So that way they can be in state and do the best that they possibly can. Cause that's where all your great energy is. Whatever you create, it's always not from anxiety. It's not from fear. It's not from anger. It's always from, you know, acceptance and neutrality and courage and these higher resignation, uh, but a little bit more about uh, what perseverance is for you. Yeah, I think it's uh, a big part of the game. One of the bigger parts of the game is is uh, being able to go through tough times and, and coming out on top. And you really see um, what your true colors are um, through tough times. And I think um, it, it's tough when you're young. And, and uh, like you said, you're probably the best player on your junior team. And, and uh, you think... Uh, Maybe you don't think, but it's going to come easy and, and everything's just going to be perfect. But uh, that's not how it is. And um, I was lucky enough to, to get a couple opportunities. Um, probably didn't play great when I was 19 when I got called up, but uh, they believed in me and, and gave me some hope. But uh, I think it, it goes back to being that consistent person every day and being the same person and, and just a good person, I think. And, and uh Having that attitude every day that you bring it, um, it goes a long way in in pro hockey, especially. It's it's hard to it's hard to play make the NHL. It's harder to stay around. And and I always said that uh, when I was younger, uh, made the NHL, played a hundred games, and got sent back down to the minors. Didn't know if I was going to come back up, but uh, that's uh, that's when you see uh, kind of what you're made of and and. Uh, Having that support system um, is huge, and, and leaning on them, I think, is is a big part of it. But it's that internal battle with uh, with yourself and, and your mind of, of how you're going to handle it. And um, there's different ways to handle it uh, away from the game, but uh, that's probably the biggest thing is that mental side of it and, and how you deal with things. And, and uh, it's only going to make you tougher. So um, I've learned a lot over my the course of my career, and I've learned from some some great guys throughout it and and i've been very lucky and and fortunate to to live my dream i think uh not many people get to do this and and i feel fortunate every day to to be able to do this and uh you get paid to to wake up go practice and be with 20 of your best buddies it's uh it's not amazing that you get paid that amount of money just to like i remember talking to mike gartner about you know the first time he got paid a million dollars and we're in the locker room and uh, and he was talking to Wes Jarvis, his, his uh, rink partner. He's like, "Hey, Rhett, Wes, remember where I was when I like? We, yeah, guards, I know exactly where we were. The phone rang. It was Neil Smith from the Rangers. You know, you took the phone. We were in a hot tub together, and you came back with a smile on your face, saying, can you believe they're going to pay me a million dollars to play hockey?' Like, <laughs> and then we were just like, ah, like. Uh, but again, and, and I don't say this because a million dollars is obviously big for you know people who don't play pro hockey." Uh, but I am a big component about, you know, uh, money will only bring you what you already have in your life. Yeah. And if you have a lot of money and you have misery, then you're going to have a lot of misery in your life. And if you have a lot of closure and balance and like support system, like you said, and you have money, then you'll have more joy in your life because you'll contribute more. And just like yourself, what you're saying, you know, people can resent hockey players for how much they make. Uh, but it's like what they do with that money and the foundations that you do and the money that you give to you. I mean, we didn't even mention that you don't, you know, you, you were able to, to curate $20,000 for the Ronald McDonald's house, you know, with your platform as well. And it's not something that you would bring up, but it's something obviously that, that we know. Uh, but these are the things that nobody hears about, you know, what you're doing with your platform and your money. And then people just think, oh, he's a million dollar hockey player just swinging around and, you know, enjoying the ride as well. But, um, you know, this is what you guys do and the support system that you get back from it know like times 10 yeah and that's uh that's probably the coolest part is is uh for my parents like uh driving me every morning waking up 
uh, and I've come to really appreciate it as I've gotten older. Um, you don't really realize how much uh, they're doing for you when you're just a kid. Uh, you think it's just normal to, to go down three hours away at 6 a.m. To, to go sit in a cold rink on a... That's what parents do. Yeah, that's what they do. And and that's probably the coolest part for me is, is my dad and my mom. They missed... Uh, my dad didn't miss a junior game, and my mom, I think, only missed one. They would drive up to the Sioux, Sudbury, everywhere. So I've always felt wow. that before. Yeah. So my dad, I think I played 260-something OHL games, and he was at every single one. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where it's so cool for me to be able to share that with them. Um, dad's trips, like, uh, it, that's my favorite time. To bring my dad around for him to see this to come on our plane to go for dinners and do all that stuff um i'm hoping for a mom's trip next year my dad's been on about six or seven so it's time for my mom we got to get my mom on one and, and let her see what's going on but uh that's the coolest part for me and and um to have that supportive uh wife and and everything like that uh that's what it's all about for me is is family and um yeah it's it's pretty cool to to grow up in canada and and be be in the nhl and and have your parents uh there every step of the way that's remarkable like i mean i i live an hour south of owen sound and i spent last year covering the team as well and you see all the parents come up from toronto which is a two-hour drive uh mm -hmm. that are like home parents and they, and they don't miss a game like you said and they go to flint they go to the sioux yeah. saginaw you know, like long stretches, especially for the OAs, because, you know, it's their last year. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this is the last, you know, gala for them as well. So they, you know, go to 68 games throughout the year. And I just, I don't know, this is crazy that mm -hmm. they do that. But you're right. The support system, you know, if you don't have that and you have a ton of money, you're still a bankrupt human being, I think. Yeah. Like, it's like the money will only give you more of what you already have in your life. And, you know, if you've got great relationships, if you've got a great support system, you've got great mental health, you've got, you know, great friends, you contribute to your community, you give back to charities as well. You make a difference in that ripple effect of how other people, you know, have their journeys altered as well. Um, I think that you're a really wealthy man, whether you make money or you don't. That's absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, with that being said, we have uh, one of our sponsors is Padskins. And uh, one thing I love about Padskins is hockey is already a crazy expensive sport. Um, so what I love about it, if you feel like a pro, you get to play like a pro. And even when I was at the Flyers alumni game this year, I brought down name bars for the guys, for the alumni. And it was kind of funny because I, I saw Howie there, uh, Mark Howe, and we gave him, you know, how on his on his gloves. Uh, which, you know, he, he, he beamed, he's like, wow, this is amazing. So hearts, he got it as well. Um, but like what we thought we could do with you guys is like for every people that you have entertaining that are hockey players that are aspiring, you let us know, uh, we'd be happy to print up their names and their numbers and they, you know, their peel and stick, they go on their gloves or their twig, wherever they want to put it as well. But it gives them that kind of like pride of ownership. You know, if you've got your own gloves, you know, you, your name's on it as well. You got a little bit more skin in the game of how that affects you as well. Um, but whatever you want as far as like helping out people as well, we'd be more than happy to make a donation uh, to your charities or to your people as well and just help them feel like they're pros as well. Because uh, I think people helping people is powerful stuff. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, Scott, really want to thank you for coming on the show today, man. It's been uh, great to have you on the show. Like I said, it's been a little while coming as well, but you're worth yeah. the wait as well and i want to thank right uh, riley cote for setting this up for us as well uh and as well with um, the flyers organization this has been a, a wonderful time for us as well i want to wish you the best of luck uh, i got my fingers crossed for our flyers uh come up in the fall uh, and i'll see you down at opening day sounds good thanks so much for having me and uh kind of shooting it so this uh this was great thank you thanks scott that is Scott Lawton, alternate captain for the philadelphia flyers my philadelphia flyers and uh just overjoyed that he you know took the the time to join us today as well. I'm going to bring up my amazing producer, Cam Rock, who produced the show today so brilliantly. Cameron, thanks a lot for all your help today. Oh, no problem. Thanks for uh, thanks for keeping me employed. <laughs> Gamefully employed. Cameron's yeah. just coming out of college, uh, everyone. So if you're looking for a full-time gig, you know, like feel free to drop us a line here because Cameron is entertaining offers. Yep, I'll. Uh, I'm an on-air personality. I, I can work behind the camera. I'll, you name it. I, I can do it. So, yeah. So what were your takeaways? 
uh, you guys talked about a lot of great stuff in there, but one thing that just really stood out to me, um, I really appreciated Scott acknowledging how important it is, the community work that it goes along with being a pro athlete. Um, I was thinking back to when TJ Brody's from Chatham, Kent, he's from right outside of Dresden where I'm from. And I remember lining up, not just me, but thousands of kids lining up just to get his autograph and meet him just being an NHL player from our community and everything like that. Like that just goes a long way. You know, I still got all the signed hats and everything upstairs. And um, another thing when you guys talked about growing the game and that's one way to do it. I think about when I was a kid, I met Sean Sweezum, former kicker for the Pittsburgh Steelers at Krabby Joe's randomly. He was just there. He's from Wallaceburg where we were. And from that day, I was a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I didn't know anything about football, but because I met Sean, I this is my favorite player. This is my team. And about, I'll say, 15 years later, I'm still a fan of the team. And it all just goes back to that moment. So it just goes to show how important it is to be in the community and do things for the kids and help grow the game like that. Yeah. And I want to say, like, if if you have the ability to, to make a difference in people's lives, whether it be through charity, I mean, it doesn't have to be through money. It could be through time. You could be volunteering somewhere, going to sick kids or going to the hospitals or volunteering for your local junior hockey team or whatever it is, you know, like yeah. just to give that energy back into your community, you'll get it back 10 times out on the outside. And that's what I love about Scott Lawton is just that he's, he's seen that, you know, he's flown under the radar for years with all the big personalities they had in Philadelphia as well. And I'm just really glad to see that he's actually just doing the right thing. He doesn't need the acknowledgement. Um, which makes him a wonderful human being as well in my books. And I, I'm just overjoyed to have him on the show just to share a little bit more of his story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, Scott was a great guest. And I, I, another thing I wanted to touch on was just the acknowledgement he gave his parents towards yeah. the end there. I mean, I, I'm sure Scott was playing the highest level he could when he was a kid playing like triple A and all that. I mean, I'm just thinking about when I played like my single A my parents are driving me to games in an hour and a half away and puck drop is until nine and they got to work in the morning and your kid plays like crap. Like, Oh, that, that would drive you nuts. You know what I mean? But like, that's what you do as a parent. You just do that type of stuff for your kids. And I mean, I can't wait to be in that same boat and uh, yell at my kid on the way home. Cause I got to work in the morning and he just played a bad game and we just drove him an hour away. <laughs> you bring up an amazing point, which is why I love having you on the show. Uh, I want to throw out a shout out to all you parents out there who take a tax to window dollar that gets, you know, halved in Canada here. And then you take that tax window dollar and you put every single resource that you never had as a parent and you give it out there to your kid and you just give them that love and that support. And, you know, that's that real like ability to believe in themselves before they believe in themselves as kids because they just mm -hmm. don't have that self esteem and confidence yet. And we don't see that as kids and we don't certainly don't appreciate it. Until we get a little older, like you said, and then that way you look back and think to myself, you know what? Like we had nothing and they gave me a hundred percent of what we had. Yeah. And, and just so that way, my experience as a kid was a little better than what he had growing up as my dad. And then, you know, as parents, that's all you want to do is pay it forward. So that way your kid has a little better than what you had growing up. Uh, and hockey is a wonderful way in Canada to do that as well. So to all you parents out there, who are spending that time on the road, who are taking your tax with no dollar and hockey's already an expensive sport. You know, I feel you. I want to thank you for being great for your kids out there. It makes a huge difference uh, moving forward. And with that, we want to thank our sponsor, Padskins, for being one of those good guys. It makes hockey inexpensive. It makes it fun. Uh, like I said, you know, you can uh, look like a pro. You don't have to be a pro, but if you feel like you're a pro, you can play like one. And that's what I love about Padskins. You can go to their website, they got name bars. They got uh, pad skins for your goalies. Uh, everything matches for pennies on the dollar as well. I want to thank our friends at Mixed Chicks Hair Products because doing this takes a lot of work as well. And again, Holy Chuck Burgers for for uh, for being our title sponsor, and also Maxwell Clothiers for making me, you know, look half decent on camera and wherever I go in overcoats as well. So. I like you said half decent there. Yeah, don't half don't decent. Yeah, like too much. You, you could put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Right? <laughs> Settle down there. You know <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> So I really want to thank you guys for showing up today, uh, for joining us for Scott Lawton as well. Uh, again, you could have been anywhere you wanted to be right now. So if you spent the last hour uh, listening to our show, really thankful for you uh, for taking the time out as well. Uh, and I will leave you with one thought uh, that if you're able to make a difference for people, please do it. You know, the world's a tough place. 
And if you're able to make that difference for other people, you'll never know the ripple effect it's going to have on everybody as well. So just be courageous, ask for help, look to see where you want to get it, where you can put your time or your energy in as well. And the difference that you'll make will be a ripple effect that you'll never see. And that's makes you a great human being. So with uh, that being said for Cam Rock as well, my producer, I'm Chuck Basti. Thanks for joining us on Chuck's World of Infinite Mojo. We'll see you next time.